Good morning, friends. It's a privilege to be here this morning in the service of the Lord, and we're hoping and trusting for a great time. I was just back in the uh, what we used to call the deacon's office, where the recorders are now, and uh, we're just talking with a young lady and her mother back there from up at Joliet, Illinois, and I was just thinking of what a product of God's grace that girl is. Most of us around here know her. She is a, a, an alcoholic, one of the worst time. And I never had the story clear to me until this morning how that when she went off the platform, the Lord had revealed to her all that was wrong and what was going to take place. And she went off the platform weeping and rejoicing because God had saved her from an, a drunkard's grave. And she, a lady walked up to her and began weeping that her daughter, I believe it was, was a dope addict. And you know, by the grace of God, that girl was called, I believe it was the next night Rosella was called, and the girl from dope was healed, and she and her husband is preaching the gospel, and, and and to see a lovely little lady like Rosella, and uh, just seasoned, and now she very respectable. She's got a feels a call in her heart, but knowing the Bible about women preachers, thing, she knows it's something else, and God's a leading her into jails and things to give testimony. It's just wonderful to. To, to know, to seek after the will of God. Sometimes we have a feeling, but we want to carry that feeling into places. You don't watch the devil take that feeling and pervert it into something. But as long as we stay in the Bible, then we're right. You see, we're moving right with the will of the Lord. And so I believe that, that Rosella will finally turn into the mission fields somewhere because America doesn't want the gospel. You know that. We just might as well admit that, that this Anglo-Saxon people is finished, that's all. There's no more gospel that America will receive. Oh, you get a few stragglings now and then, but just as the gospel, it's over. And um, you can't even preach to them, can't talk to them. They won't believe nothing. See, they've got their own hard-headed ideas, and they're set. And the next thing for this nation is judgment. Amen. She's going to have it, too. It may be through depression. It may be through an atomic bomb. It may be through a great plague of disease or something, but she's ready. It's a coming. Thousands times thousands will fall. We passed by yesterday, Brother Zabel and I, to uh, uh, Brother Woods, coming in from down in Kentucky, where we've been for three days and passed by a housing project. And Brother Zabel said, there's not, I forget, not hardly any of those people in that project. It even goes to any church. You asked him about it. Well, we got our television. That's how we find comfort. See? That's the American attitude. We got television. We got plenty of money. We got fine cars. We got nice homes. What do we need with the Lord? We don't need that. That's the attitude. About the only religion and salvation we have and love is amongst real godly people. You know the Bible said that would happen? Amen. You know Bible readers, I heard you holler amen as you preacher back there. That's right. The love would be so... Far away in the last days, the only love there would be left would be between the elect of God's people. The father would be against mother and mother against father and children against parents and different ones against each other. And the only love would be left would just be that elect, just the elected. The word elect there comes from the word elected. God's elected people. And when Rosella was quoting the story to me, in the room a while ago, I was just thinking that on that night she said something happened and how that set all down through her life when she'd be a, just a wall-eyed alcoholic. Couldn't know alcohol synonymous, four doctors give her up, nothing could be done. And how from that very moment something taken place. Now, She's not that batty eyed. She's a lovely, beautiful young woman of a 33 years old and a pastor about 22. Just how that God did for her, what he did, and um, how she looks different. And, but I said, Rosella, 
Before the foundation of the world, God ordained that moment. Yeah. Amen. Right? And when little old Billy Paul back there, where is that, was pushing out prayer cards to people that night, how little did he know who he was giving a prayer card to? Isn't it wonderful, Rosella? Amen. The Lord bless you, Rosella. I'm sure we will do that. She wants the church to pray that God will guide her. That's the follow his unchanging hand. Amen. Oh, that's so good. Had an awful proposition put before me this morning by some a malted, times malted, times malted millionaire that wants to produce here at Louisville, Kentucky and build me a five million dollar tabernacle. <laughs> but something down in my heart said, hold on, you're not a pastor. <laughs> So then, five million dollars of money that would be appropriated, and I'd to have to go to the government to pay for whiskey and stuff like that, but wants to put it on a tabernacle for the Lord. But I hope that it goes to some servant of God that'll, and some service of God, but that's five million dollars appropriated now. Think of that. Amen. What a tabernacle that would make. See how flowery that looks, Rosella? But there's something down here that says different. <laughs> See? Something down here. We come into this little old tabernacle, you strangers. Well, this could be a glamorous place here on the corner. You know, realize that. That people has wanted to build this place and make it, but this is the way we like it. Amen. See, this is the way we like it. Uh, old seats we were sitting on there was uh, all the old original seats out of the tabernacle here. Went through the flood and floated up my Bible. Laying open like that on a pulpit and stuck against the ceiling and come back down with a word on it. I, the Lord, have planted it. I'll water it day and night, lest some shall pluck it from my hand. How they rode across the top of it with a skiff here, and she come right back down the seats, moving right back to their place. All I had to do was scrub it out and go on, see? see? So this is just the way we like it. <laughs> Where it's a common people, common place, and a wonderful Lord. <laughs> Amen. Now, Today, we got some, we're just beginning to get over into the cream, you know, after the, the milk's all taken out, and it's the cream. And remember, it takes the milk to produce the cream, you know. The, the cream is the contents of the milk. So we've been in the first, second, and we're ending up in the third and beginning in the fourth chapter of the glorious uh, book of Hebrews. And all the teachings of this book, we could stay with it for on one verse for three months and just show that the entire Bible ties into every verse in the Bible. Amen. Did you ever think of that? There's not one verse that you can put your finger on, but what with the grace and the help of the Holy Spirit that we can tie Genesis or Revelations right into it. Amen. There's not another piece of literature written anywhere that can do that. And mathematically and geographically in every way, there's not a book in the Bible wrote like the Bible. There's not a book in the world, I mean, wrote like the Bible. Amen. There's nothing. The pneumatics of the Bible is perfectly in harmony. Just even chapters and punctuations and everything is perfect. Yes. Not another book you couldn't read a chapter out of without crossing itself back. But there's not one cross up in the entire Bible and was wrote by many, many, many people and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years apart, not knowing one piece. One wrote it here and one wrote it here and one wrote it over here. When it's all formed together, it made God's Bible and not one contradicts the other. And no, not mathematics, geographics, anything else of the Bible, everything, pneumatics, everything runs perfectly together. Amen. That is inspired. I don't know. What would you call inspiration? I'm so glad for the blessed old Bible. Some of them said, are you a Catholic, Protestant? I said, neither one. I believe the Bible. <laughs> I try to believe the Bible. And I'm glad that we still have the freedom to preach it in this nation. Amen. Oh, it's wonderful. Now we're going to study from it. And now we'll turn over in the book of the Hebrews. 
and begin with the third chapter, and we left off at the 15th verse. And now, y'all, I seen somebody notice while I going, I picked up my reading glasses. It's not that my eyes are bad, but I'm past 40 years old. <laughs> I can read it right here, just ordinarily, but I can read it better with the glasses. And they made me a pair of reading glasses that I want to use because I can read it better and faster. And I, that's what I got them for. Now, in the... First, we want a little background. Because there may be some strangers among us that has not picked up the first part of the book of Hebrews. Are you Miss Cox sitting right here on the end? Well, I am sure glad to see her. Just before I start as a testimony to the grace of God, here was a woman with a cancer eating her face off. That's Sister Woods' mother. And uh, I was in Michigan with Jean and Leo, and I'm taking the recordings. And on the road home, wife called me, or I called her, and she said, go to prayer immediately for Miss Cox, Miss Woods' mother, for our cancer is eating her face off. Done one into the side of the eye and down to the bone slick on the side of her face, just scattering. Some doctor done something other to it, just made it worse and just scattered it up, put some kind of medicine in it. And they brought her from down to Camelsville, Kentucky, up to, I believe, Acton, Kentucky, up to, uh, to Louisville for treatment. And, uh, so Mrs. Woods, the first time I ever seen her, that she was tore up because, of course, it was her, her, her mama, and sure she'd feel tore up. Went into the room and prayed for her with the confidence that God said he'd answer prayer, and a few days she was out, and there she sits now with just uh, amazing grace, how he's done for her. Would you stand up? I don't want to make you a, a, a public. Where, where was the cancer located on, on the side of the face? See there, on that side of her face, down around here to her cheekbone, up around her eye, and God healed her. Isn't he wonderful? How many was your last Sunday to see what the Lord did by a vision? Man, both crippled and blind, sitting right here in a wheelchair. And something hurt me when that old man sitting here said, Brother Branham, I believe it's this brother right here, said, do the same for my wife. He's got a wife here that's crippled. My heart just melted. I wish to, I'd give anything in the world if I could. But it's not, don't lay in my power. But it does lay in my power and your power to pray that God will do it. He's got a crippled wife, a paralyzed hand, a paralyzed foot, looks like. And this man was far worse off than her because she can stand up and can walk a little. But this man could not even do that. And he, the brain, main balanced nerve was gone. Males, a lot of the others would give him up. And a Catholic sent him here, a Catholic doctor. And his boy is a priest at St. Minard's. Down in Jasper, Indiana. But that's laying foundation stones for that revival coming up down there. And when he raised up, he said, but I can't. He looked said, yes, I can. He thought he couldn't see, you know. And he looked up and he just had to raise his head up. And there he could walk and see. Walked down that aisle by himself. And they were Presbyterians. He was Orthodox. And ta- you think it's just the Pentecostal or the holiness people can shout. You're mistaken. <laughs> they could sure do some shouting when you see something like that happen. <laughs> Hugging each other and shouting, walked right out and down the steps, pushing his wheelchair, walking with the balance nerve out of his head. Think of it. Walking like you or I would walk. Oh, he's wonderful. Now, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and in this writing of Hebrews, he wrote it, and before he wrote these books, we find out now we go, this is a Sunday school class, and I'll try to watch and not take too long, and then we're going to have services to continue them on tonight, the Lord willing. Now, in the book of Hebrews and the rest of the epistles of Paul, who was Paul? He was a staunch Hebrew, a scholar. And a great teacher of the Old Testament. And he had been taught by one of the best men of his day. Somebody tell me what his name was. Gamaliel. One of the greatest teachers of his day. And Paul had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. 
There's something about the where you go, what church you go to, and what teacher teaches you. Do you know that? It's got something to it. Therefore, we are to seek out the very best that we can find so we're getting the best. Not because it's sociable and so forth, but the real Bible teaching. Look, one time when Israel had got out into the wilderness with their armies and they had a seven-day compass and they run out of water and they were about to perish, they said, oh, if there was a prophet near. And one of them said, we have down here Elisha. He poured water on the hands of Elijah. See his associates? In other words, here's Elisha who has had associations with Elijah. The word of the Lord is with him. You get it? He'd been taught right. And he said, he's here. Let's go down and consult him. Because his teacher was Elijah. And he's got the teaching of Elijah in him. See what a difference it makes? Sure. We want to be taught so. Paul had the teaching of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was that great man who made the choice, being a scholar himself, that when all this carrying on started of the early church, he said, let's not put our hands on that, brethren. If it is not of God, it will come to naught anyhow. But if it is of God and we fight against it, we'll find ourselves fighting against God. See, he'd had some good teaching. Paul had come up under this man. And he knew that Paul was a great teacher. So one day, honest in heart, persecuting the church, going down to arrest them. Now let's take just another little phase from Paul as we get our background. When Judas fell by transgression, by the love of money and the pride of life, he fell from grace and went to his place. And the disciples said there must be twelve. And the church, with all of its dignity, to show you what the church is, with all of its dignity, with all of its power, it's still millions of miles short at its very best. They said, we've got to look out one among us who will take the place. And they chose by casting lots, Matthias. Matthias, I believe, or Matthias, Matthias, I believe it is. And whenever they chose him and put him with the twelve, with the eleven, which made up the twelve, he did not do one thing. That's the only time his name's ever mentioned in the Scriptures. That was the church making its choice. Now they thought, he is a gentleman, no doubt. He's a wonderful man. He's a scholar. He's smart. He's educated. He's a wonderful person. He would take the place of Judas and be one of us. But you know, God sometimes makes some of the, to our opinion, some of the most foolish choices. Now, God seen a little hook-nosed Jew, just as full of temper as he could be, with his mouth sitting sideways, I'll go down and rest every one of them, I'll, I'll throw them in jail, I'll do this. That was God's choice. Amen. The rest of them taking a scholar and a diplomat. That's the church's choice. See, you don't know who that is at the altar. You don't know who that is you're testifying in jail or wherever it is. It might look like a pugilist, his ears broke down, eyes skinned up, and, but you don't know who that is. You just cast your lot. That's all. Give him the word. God takes the choice. And God chose this little high-tempered Jew or chose him rather. On his road down, I'll go down and get him. I'll, I'll show him what I can do like that. And God just knocked him down. God said, that's my choice right there. Wouldn't that be foolish to the church? Why, well, he persecutes the church. He's a carnal man. But God knows what was on the inside of man. See what I mean? So, Paul had an experience. How many believe the experience comes by conversion? Sure. If it has, now I doubt the conversion. 
uh, conversion brings experience, and you can't lot it to anything now. Sometimes it might be shouting, sometimes it might be speaking with tongues, sometimes it might be weeping, sometimes it might be groaning. You don't know what it is, so don't try to lot it because every one of you's proved to be wrong in it. You Methodists and you Baptists and you Nazarenes and Pentecostals, I've seen people shout as hard as they can shout and steal a gold out of your teeth. They could. Yes, sir. I've seen people speak with tongues like poor and peas on a dry cow hide and, and honest to goodness with a chew tobacco on the other side of the mouth and cut your throat if they could do it. That's right. So them things has no, there's no evidence that you can prove it only by the life the person lives. By their fruit you shall know them. So that's all up to God. He makes a choice. He brings the things together. And that's the way it is. So if your life is comparing with the fruits of the Bible... You got a pretty good conception of your spirit's bearing record with his spirit. That's your sons and daughters of God. You're, all the old evils dropped away and everything's become new and you're living in love and you got peace and grace and so forth. You're getting pretty close to the kingdom then. Because the life that's in you is producing that kind of a lot, see? If you say, oh, hallelujah, I spoke the tongues, hallelujah, that don't mean nothing. That don't mean a bit more if you're Got out your and played a tune on a guitar or something. That doesn't mean one thing. Though you spoke with tongues, though you shouted and ran up down the aisle and cried tears till like you'd been peeling onions, that don't mean one thing. Not one thing, unless that everyday life backs up just exactly. Stays with it. Now, if you do those things plus that life, amen. That, that's fine. That's good. But you can do those things without having that life. So then... No shouting, no nothing like that is evidence. Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. And the fruit of the Spirit is not speaking with tongues. That's not the fruit of the Spirit. Shouting is not the fruit of the Spirit. Weeping is not the fruit of the Spirit. But love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit's fruit is. All right. Now, the reason we have these things, they like to make organizations, you see. Well, we'll have it, bless God, all believes the way we do, we'll go this way. And all believes like we do, we'll go this way. But God wants all to go this way. <laughs> right up. Now, Paul, after he had this experience, then he thought that was a wonderful experience. Now, how, let's, let's, let's quote that ex- experience a little bit. Paul was on his road to Damascus. To arrest some people down there because the gospel had got scattered down there. Gospel means the good news. And so they got scattered down there and many people is raising up full of love and joy and loving the Lord Jesus. And it got scattered down that way. So Paul got some letters from the high priest. He said, I'll go down and I'll arrest them every one. So he took him a little company of guards, temple guards, soldiers. Way down the road he went. While they were marching down the road and him just all go what he's going to do. All of a sudden, something happened. All of a sudden, there was a great light before him. Great light. Now, it shined like the sun. That's a strange thing to happen. The light shined in so much that he just, his eyes went out almost and fell to the ground. And he, he's laying down on the ground. And he looked up. There's probably 10 or 15 men with him. Did any of those men see that light? No, sir. Paul saw it. It wasn't designated for that man to see it. So some people can see things where others don't. See? So Paul saw that light. In so much that it even blinded him. He couldn't see for several days. It was such a reality to him. And he couldn't see for several Later on, when he wrote letters, his eyes bothered him some bad from that until he wrote with great big letters. He said, seeing it, I have written to you with large letters. He could hardly see. He's in jail. And he asked the Lord to heal him of it. And he consulted him three times. But what did the Lord say? My grace is sufficient, Paul. Paul said, then will I glory in my infirmities because 
He said, except I would be exalted above the abundance of the revelation, there was given to me a messenger of the devil, a thorn in the flesh that buffet me. He'd get better for a while and go away to go again. Buffet means blow after blow. Like the ship on the sea, you know, the waves buffet it. The blow after blow. And he would he'd get better and then have it again, then get better and have it again. He said, Lord, what's the matter? You don't take this away from me. He said, my grace is sufficient, Paul. Amen. Just keep on. He, keep, he said, now, if, it, if I was just perfect and everything perfect, said, then when I went along, oh, I'd get puffed up and say, you see, uh, nothing wrong with me. The Lord takes care of me, brother. Hallelujah. Yeah. Then you're getting self-righteous. Amen. God has to give you a little something once in a while to kind of meeken you up a little, Amen. you know. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Kind of make you realize that he's the boss. <laughs> Amen. Oh, isn't he wonderful? Amen. Yes, sir. Just glory. So he, Paul then, well, after having this great experience, now if that would have been somebody today that said, oh, bless God, hallelujah, bro, the Lord's done something for me, glory to God. But not Paul. He was a Bible scholar. That experience must tally with God's Word. Amen. Yes, sir. If it isn't all together hooked into the Bible, not just look over and say, oh, yes, here it is right here. Bless God, I got it. Uh-uh, that's not the way God gives it. It must be the entire Bible. Amen. All of it. Because you can, infidels use this Bible for their grounds to debate on. But they'll take a little scripture here, turn over here and get another little one over here and try to make them tie together. And it's two different subjects all together. Amen. So you've got to make scripture compare with scripture. As Isaiah said, the 28th chapter, it must be line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little, hold fast to that what's good. See, that's the way it comes. Line upon line, upon line, word upon word, scripture upon scripture. It must all compile together. That's why I think in these lessons like we're having now, it's a great thing to the church because it brings them to a place that all the scriptures tie together. Amen. And our experience must tie with that scripture. Amen. Oh, here it is. If it doesn't, then it's wrong. Amen. Amen. And how that I walked for years not knowing what that light was that struck Paul down. When the outside world, the scriptures, the people, the preachers try to tell me, that's of the devil. Well, you'll be a fortune teller. You'll be a spiritualist. Don't you fool with that, Billy. Something wrong with that. Don't you do that, boy. That's wrong. That's the devil. Oh, boy, you'll be a regular medium. You'll be a spiritualist if you do that. Oh, that's of the devil. That's, that's not right. But when, I didn't want to preach that, but as on the road down to Damascus, Paul didn't want to preach it. So he found out whether it was right or not. So he goes down into Arabia for three years and studies the scripture. Amen. <laughs> when he come out, he said, now shake it out of me. <laughs> he knew he had to face Pharisees. He had to face Sadducees. He had to face the world and the Gentile world. And so Paul, this Bible is written. This book of Hebrews is written for that purpose. He's shaking those Hebrews. Amen. And taking that Old Testament and showing it over here in the New Testament. This is God, he said. Amen. Here it is on, on all the prophets and everything. Starts off back there at the beginning of the first chapter we had. For God in sundry times. Way back in old times. In divers manners. Spoke to the fathers by the prophets. That's how God brought his message. Tested by the Urim thunder. Amen. But in this day has spoke to us to his son Christ Jesus Tested by his Bible. Amen. There you are. So these experiences that the world says, oh, it's mental. Why, nobody, when that angel appeared, that light down here on the river, when I preached my first revival here on the corner and was baptized, all those people, I believe Brother Fleeman, you might have been. And I don't know whether you were sure then or not. How many were sure when the, when the light appeared on the river? Is any old timers sure? Yes, some of them. When it down here on the river. And they said it was just an optical illusion. Many of us are standing looking at it. And here it come down. And then years later, God proved it by a mechanical eye of a camera. It's true. Well, is it, is it some fictitious? Is it something? That, uh, no, sir. 
We're putting it right here in the Bible and showing you it's the same Lord Jesus. Amen. He does the same thing. His action is the same. His power is the same. Look last Sunday here. You ought laying on my bed. Never seen a man in my life. Come out and said, there's a man at the tabernacle. And he's gray, uh, black-headed, graying. He's blind. He can't walk. He's in a wheelchair. A black-headed man sent him up. A doctor. Dr. Ackerman, a black-headed man, Catholic man, sent a man sit right there. And thus saith the Lord raised up, walked out with his sight and everything. Amen. What did it? Here's the same angel. The same one that struck Paul down Amen. on the road going down to Damascus lives in his church and his people today. Hallelujah. It's Scripture comparing with Scripture. Amen. That's the way it must be. All we have the lukewarms. We're getting into that after a while. Oh, we got a deep thing before us so we can just get into it today and tonight. Now it's just beginning to get into the deep waters. Where you, you know, when I was a little boy, I used to have a little pond out behind the place and I'd go out there and all of us little kids would go in nude, little about six, seven years old, and we, the water's about that deep. It wasn't no more than a hog water. And I had a soapbox there. And I'd show like a dive, hoping it was a flash going like that. And my little belly would hit the mud, you know, and it would just fly every way. I told my daddy I could swim. He took me back there one day and he said, I want to see you swim. And I jumped off there, you know, stripped my clothes and a little locust ticket and run down, hit the water. I began splashing the mud, flying every way, and Pop was sitting on a culvert. He sat there and watched me for a few minutes and said, get out of that hole of water and get yourself a bath and get home, see? Well, that's just about the way some of us that call ourselves Christian. We mud crawl. That's right. Long as you're anchored, I'm a Methodist, I'm a Pentecostal, I'm a Presbyterian, I got an evidence, I got it. You're a mud crawling. One day I was with my uncle and I kept telling him he was about 15, 16 years old, we was at the river. I said, Uncle Lark, I can swim. And I was sitting on the back of the boat, Joe, felt good and safe. He just took the oar and pushed me out in about 10 foot of water. It was different then. <laughs> All the splashing and screaming you ever heard in your life. Someday you get pushed off. You better know where you're standing. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. If you know him, you better really know him. Amen. That's right. But now we're going into deep water. Deep water. Where it'll make you drown if, you, if you're not a good, fattened up Christian. Notice the word. Paul first found that he went back in the Old Testament and he found this. He's seen that experience of his absolutely now, what was that that struck me down? It was a light. Big light standing there, shining like the sun, standing in front of his face. And he said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? He said, Lord, who are you that I persecute? He said, I'm Jesus. I thought he was a, a man. That scarred hand that the claims appearing in meetings now with nail scars in his hands and his head. No, no. Not that body. Amen. Not that body. Amen. See, he's now a light. Amen. Saul, when he's here on earth, he said, I come from God, I go back to God. Amen. Amen. He was the angel that led the children of Israel in this light to the wilderness. He returned back to that same light. And Paul saw it out of the Old Testament. Amen. He said, I'm Jesus, the angel of the covenant. And he become flesh to redeem us. Amen. Took on not the form of angels we find in previous chapters we are studying. He never took on the nature of angels, but was the seed of Abraham. Amen. That he might be known. That man could see God. Amen. Amen. Now he says, I return back to that. And when Paul seen that, he said, sure, that was him. Amen. That was him. Peter had an experience one night. While he was praying, that same light come into the building, opened up the doors before him, went out into the streets, and Peter thought he was dreaming. He was so anointed. He didn't know what taking place. He said, I just woke up, but am I here on the street? And he went out of John Mark's house, and the little girl opened the door. Some little lady there had been in a prayer meeting. Somebody was knocking at the door, opened up the door. And, oh, she said, here's Peter right now. You're praying for him to get out of prison. The Lord has delivered him. Oh, they said, go on. Oh, Lord, deliver him. Why, she said, he's standing at the door knocking. Peter just kept pounding. Let me in. Oh, she said, it's Peter. Them days, they still have it, a little drawbar. 
little li a lid here, you raise that and look out, see? Before you let your guests in, you have to know who's knocking at your door. Because they had robbers that you open the door, they kill you. So he opened the door, she said, it's Peter. They said, oh, oh my, he's dead. That's his angel standing there. <laughs> see? Done got his glorified body, you know, that theostomy. Remember how we tuck it, the big diamond? How it reflected the light? How it went back to there? The, this earthly tabernacle will be dissolved. We have one already waiting. And they thought Peter Dunn died. This old body had dropped mid buried a few days. He'd entered into his angel or his glory, not glorified body, but in his theostomy, the body that's already prepared. It couldn't shake your hands. It has no hands to shake like that. But it's in the image of a man. Come down and was knocking at the door. She said, no, it's Peter. He's standing there. He opened the door and walked in. There you are. Now, Peter had been delivered by this light. Now, the same way that that early, uh, Paul in the early church seen that light of God that sh shined on Paul, the same thing has come down. Now, people can say anything. That doesn't make it right. But when God proves anything, Amen. the work of it proves it. Then the camera proves it. And everything that we, uh, the Lord has did has been absolutely, infallibly proved that it's God. Amen. By the scriptures, by its action, by experience. But they won't listen. Look here in this tabernacle for now, remember. You know this. We don't crave crowds. We ain't got a place to put them anyhow. But look, a meeting of this type where we're coming together this ought to attract the four cities. But they're dead. They're absolutely dead. They have eyes, but they can't see. You say, well, Brother Brandon, won't they go to a doctor and get their eyes fixed? He can't fix that kind of seeing. Jesus said, if you would have known me, you would have known my day. He said, you blind Pharisees, you can discern the face of the skies, but the signs of the time, you can't discern. Does that go over the top of your head? Listen, look at the signs we're living in here. Now, I just ain't some, I myself, I'm just a man. Uh, not even a preacher uh, to talk about. I have no education what the world call a preacher. And we're just poor people. Look at the building we're in. Look at the cathedrals this morning. But look where God's at. Yeah. There's the thing. So was Moab standing there in all his splendor and his beauty. But there was Israel in tents. But where was God at? Yeah. There's a bunch of the holy rollers down there doing everything there was. It was wrong. But Balaam, their, their bishop, Failed to see that smitten rock, that brass serpent, that pillar of fire. His eyes was blind. He couldn't see it. He said, they're just imagining that. But he was dead. Bless God. Oh, he's here. God is here. And he's doing the same thing that he has done. And he will, we compare Scripture with Scripture. God has never painted himself some big something on earth, but he's always dwelt among the common and humble people. And here he is this morning doing the same thing. The Scripture vindicates it. The camera vindicates it. Now that reason I refer to that picture, it isn't because I'm there. I'm, I'm just a sinner saved by grace like you are. But what I'm trying to say is it's His presence with us. Amen. That's the main thing. Amen. Yeah. Well, if He made me an a incarnated Elisha, if you didn't have faith to believe it, it would never do you any good. Amen. He came to His own. His own received Him not. That's the reason you're in the city today. Well, I could start a revival here in some big building or something. You would never get many people that believe it. They just won't. They can't. Their day is done. This same lesson this morning in Africa would pro probably produce 10,000 at least, 10,000 souls to Christ. Or there might be one sinner sitting here this morning or something. Some backslider. Most of them is just combed through and through until it's just finished. That's all. But what we're trying to say is Scripture compares with Scripture. Now, no matter how great the experience is, unless it compares with the Scripture, it's wrong. Amen. The Urim Thundam. 
No matter how good the prophet was, if he spoke and them lights didn't flash on the Urim Thundam, it was wrong. How well the dream seemed, if it didn't flash on the Urim Thundam, it was wrong. When that priesthood ended, God put his Bible up. Paul said, if an angel from heaven would come, Amen. Amen. Galatians 1.8, and would preach any other gospel than what's already been preached to you, let him be accursed. Amen. The angel from heaven said to John the Revelator, which was God himself, I, Jesus, sent my angel to vindicate or to show these things. He said, if any man will add one word to it or take one word out of it, the same will be taken out of the book of life for him. Amen. This is it. The Bible. Amen. Therefore, these experiences and these things that we're having to happen here, if it wasn't vindicated by God's word, it would be wrong. I don't care what would take place, it would be wrong. Amen. So it's scripturally absolutely the truth. Amen. Oh, I'm so happy I'm a member of the great body of Christ. Amen. Now, let's go now. We're coming down to the lesson. Now, we ended up over here where he said, seeing that we're compassed about... No, I'm sorry. That's us quoting 12th chapter. I've been reading it, but I haven't studied it. I've, Brother Norman's staying at my home up there, and he knows that I just got in yesterday. And the brothers know down there, I just got in, and the only time I got to read the scripture down was sitting right here a few minutes ago. That's right. Don't study it. I just wait for the Holy Spirit to give it, just as He wants it. He knows where the person's at, at that has to have it. So if I got something made up my mind, I'm going to say, then it's wrong. But if I just let Him do it, He'll take it right straight to the spot where it belongs. Amen. Take no thought what you shall say, for it's not you that speaks; it's your Father that dwelleth in you. He doeth the speaking. Amen. Now, the last chapter, uh, the previous chapter, we heard this that. How shall we escape if we neglect this great salvation? Who was first preached to us by the Lord Jesus, and him with those who heard him, the same things that Jesus did to show them, same things like takes place here, same angel of God, same works, same evidence, same everything, everything along, same gospel, right with the word. If that was taught by the Lord, then confirmed by his disciples, that we've heard, Paul being the same, how shall we escape if we neglect such great salvation? Now, Paul was saying that to his Hebrew audience. Now, they didn't have tape recorders today like we got here, but they had scribes who were sitting there taking it down, just as Paul was preaching it, and that's what it is right here. We're getting about tape recorders, and these tapes go over the world, see, to show that it is the truth. Our religion is not in vain. It's absolutely the resurrected Jesus Christ. Amen. Same thing. Now, we mustn't neglect it. Now, just don't go away from church today and say, Well, I kind of enjoy going down there. I like the singing. and The people are friendly around that little old church. Don't do that. Brother, let your heart become a flame. Say, Here, i got to do something about this. i got to get out and see if I can get somebody saved. And don't go out and say, Bless God, if you don't repent, you're going to a parish. No. Going to jail, be as wise as a serpent, as harmless as a dove. See, that's the way to go. Amen. Approach the person if he's raising chickens, talk about chickens to him for a while. See, and then first thing you know, he'd be talking about, or if he's a farmer, talk about his farm. If he sells automobiles, talk about his automobiles for a while. What nice cars you got, and so forth. See, till you catch the spirit when Father says, "Now is the time to approach him about his soul." You can wind it off. You see. That's a fine automobile. You know, transportation today has become great. Oh, how the nations have been brought close together and the cities of our nations close together. Friends and mothers can visit each other. You know, it's a wonderful thing to have automobiles like your son. Yes, sir, it sure is. Mm -hmm. You know, a puppet on his cigar or whatever it is. Yeah, them, them's good cars. Did you ever think of what the old timers would have thought if they'd seen something like that? Just keep going like that. Yes, yes, yeah, sure is. You know, Another thing it does, it brings like we're having like in revivals. People can come across the country quickly for a revival. See, you're opening the way all the time, you know. God, and if you feel something ch chug up the way, stop right there. Move over here. Like a doctor said out of Phoenix. said, Lord, fill my mouth with good words and then nudge me when I've said enough. <laughs> See, <you know>. <laughs> <laughs> nudge me when I've said enough. Now, notice now we're going to start from the 15th chapter, a 15th verse of the third chapter. Closely now. 
While it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. I watch Paul speaking here. I had said today, after so long a time, we're going to get into it. After a while, that today is so long a time. Comes into the next chapter. After so long a time, it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. When they provoke God. Now let's read the next verse. For some, when they had heard, did provoke. Now what's he talking about? Gospel. How be it not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, but with whom he was grieved for forty years, was it not with them that it sin whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Let's stop here a minute. The provocation. When they provoke. Now what did God do? Now Paul's trying to speak. What is it led them out of Egypt? Was it Moses? No. Moses was the flesh instrument. Now, we've got a background here. We want to get straightened out. Now, when we hit this spot down here in a few minutes, you, you'll see it. Now, God had his people with unsettled rest. They were down in Egypt. They were out of the right position. They were out of their homelands. They were strangers and pilgrims. And God was going to bring them from that housed-in place in, in Egypt up to the homeland. A type of today. We're unsettled. Here, it don't take long. Little chubby-handed boys playing marbles. Little girls with the dollies playing. The first thing you know, you got gray hair and wrinkled it up. There's something wrong here. This is not home. We're in the wrong place. That's why we say we are pilgrims and strangers. Something's happened. A little lady said this morning in the room about how people laugh at her sometimes. I said, but sister dear, you're not of them people. We are different people. My little girl said, uh, daddy, certain, certain girls did certain, certain things that they did. I said, but look, honey, they had these records of Elvis Presley. I said, I wouldn't want them in my house. She said, but daddy, they're nice little girls. I said, they may be. I have nothing to say against that. But there's one thing. We are different. We are different. Not as that we want to be different. But the spirit that's within us has come out of that. You're of another world. When I go into Africa... I can't get adjusted to their, their, their ways of living. They don't wear any clothes. They're naked. And they pick up something that's rotten, got maggots in it, they eat it anyhow. Don't make any difference. See, I, it, it, this is different. You know, one time we were all like that. But civilization has brought us and made us different. And conversion has doubled that by millions. We don't want the rotten things of the world no more. Christ has made us become Christians. Like civilization has made us become clean. And notice, not only that, but we profess that we're pilgrims and strangers. We're not of the world. Then you want nothing to do with the world. And those things has passed away. Now Israel was down in Egypt. They wasn't Egyptians. Egyptians, it was a disgrace for an Egyptian to put his hands on a sheep. And Israel were sheep herders. And how it must have got Moses. <laughs> After all the indignity of being an Egyptian cattle raisers. Did you notice what the Pharaoh had said to Joseph and so forth? It is an abomination. He said, your people are sheep herders. And even an Egyptian couldn't even put his hands on a sheep herder. He was a different people. And that's the way it is with a Christian today. When he's born again, it's not it's filthy for him to associate. Where people are drinking and telling dirty jokes and 
women naked and everything. It, it's, it's filthiness. No, blessed be the Lord. We are pilgrims here. We're strangers here. The Spirit has been converted and we're looking for a city where women don't wear shorts. We're looking for a city where they don't have beer taverns. We're looking for a city where in dwelleth righteousness. So we're pilgrims. So God came down in a big bundle of fire as a halo, swept down into a bush and began to reveal himself to Moses first. Moses said, you know how we had the lesson the other night? How that when Jesus was here on earth, he said, well, before Moses was, I am. That was Jesus in the burning bush, in the pillar of fire. It's Jesus today. The same. And he revealed himself in a pillar of fire. And Moses got the experience. He goes down into Egypt. He preaches the gospel, the good news, and signs and wonders followed him. You get it? Same thing today. Not only that, but when them Hebrews come out, walked in the light, they was led by the same pillar of fire. And the Bible said that, do not tempt God. Watch this, let me read it. While it is said today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, his voice, speaking to your heart, as in the provocation, when they provoked him, listen, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. How many knows that the Israelites provoked God with their unbelief? Amen. They murmured, they completely, God walked right down there, and when he got out, the first thing, they got in trouble. Here was this pillar of fire above them. I don't know where they all saw it or not. At least Moses saw it, and it was above them, and they watched it. And when they come down, say it, they didn't see it. I don't know where they did or not. It went before them. The Bible said it was there. It said the star went before the wise man. Nobody saw it but the wise man. It went over every observatory. They kept time to the stars. No one saw it but the wise man. It was for them to see it. And the wise man was who the star was sent for. And the pillar of fire was sent to Moses, and Moses was sent to the children of Israel. And they were supposed to follow Moses. They could see Moses, and Moses saw the light. There they went. There they were leading. And as they went out, they come to the Red Sea. And all the they had seen all those signs of miracles and things taking place while they were still down in the in the old land of Egypt. But when they got out there in their journey, just converted and brought out. Then the first thing you know, they got in trouble. God loves to bring you in trouble. He loves to put trouble down and see what you'll do about it. Amen. So he just stopped up the Red Sea and the first thing you know, marched him right out into this place and then sent Pharaoh after him. See how God likes to do it? He loves to display his power and love. He's God. And he just loves to show you who he is. Amen. Amen. And the trouble of it is today, people say, oh, them days is past. No. How can God display himself Amen. when you're taught such stuff as that? But God loves to manifest himself. Here come the children of Israel walking in the light. Moses going on before them. There they was. Come on. This is the way. God's calling. We're going out. We're going to the promised land. Oh, hallelujah. Here they all were shouting and jumping and having a good time, you know. And the first thing you know, they looked back and said, Oh, what's that dust? One of them climbed up on the hill and said, Oh, alas, alas, it's Pharaoh's army. God said, What you so scared about? Didn't you believe what I did down there? What you so worried about? Why you make me angry? When he got down there, Moses went out and interceded to God. God just opened up the Red Sea and they walked across. Closed the enemy, and that's the way God does it. Don't get scared. Don't get all excited. Don't be frustrated. You provoke God. Then what did he do? Look like, well, we had one big trial. Bless God, we got over. We won't have no more. We're on a road to the promised land. And he led them right out into the desert where there's no water. Could you imagine? God, with his, with his sanctified, holy people, led them right out in this trap. 
They got him out of that trap and let him run out here where there's no water. When he could have took him some way where there was water. Well, he could have just made a river all the way along if he wanted to. He could have broke every mountain into joy, spurting water 50 feet in the air if he wanted to. Sure he could. But if he'd done that, it'd been too easy. Oh, bless be the name of the Lord. Why did God let this happen, Brother Brown? Why did God? God's doing that. Let him alone. Just walk on. That's God's business. The footprints of the righteous are ordered by the Lord. Yes, sir. What difference does it make? Lost all my money, Brother Brown, but bless God anyhow. Amen. Oh, I did this and this happened the storm blew away my house. Bless God anyhow. The Lord give, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Let's keep walking on. It's all the glory of God. God knows what He's doing. Some through the water, some through the flood, Amen. some through deep trial, but all through the blood. That's the way He leads us. That's right. Oh, my, I feel like I could just stop and scream. That's why he leads his dear children. Oh, can you just feel, now I'm not a psychologist, but can you just feel that lovely spirit now bathing over the building? What if our eyes would come open just now and look what's standing around the sides of these walls, looking down these eyes. Amen. Oh, Elisha, one morning when that boy was just as blind as he could be, he said, look at the series down there. I said, but he's more with us. I said, I don't see nobody. He said, Lord, open that boy's eyes. He looked around that old prophet all around that oh, mountains was on fire and horses of fire and chariots of fire. Amen. He was convinced then. He said, we just go out and smite them blind. They had their sight. This is perfect as ever did, but they're blind to him. He said, you all seeking Elijah? He said, yes. I said, come on, I'm sure where he's at. And that was him leading them. They didn't know it. Amen. That's the way it is today. Christ is here. The Holy Ghost is here doing the same things that He's always done. And the world is blind to it. They don't know it. Oh, I don't know about that. My pastor, I, oh, poor decrepit people. See what I mean? They're blind to it. They don't know it. God's the leading. Now they come up to the wilderness of sin. There was no water there. God just had it all provided. Oh, and they found a puddle of water. They said, this is it. And they couldn't even taste it. Oh, it was terrible. My eyes is worse than 100% sulfur. See? Just like rotten age. You know, ooh, my eyes turn. It was poison. Now, I call the wilderness of sin. Several palm trees grow there in the spring where those palms grow. Then Moses said, Don't, God said, what are, what, are they, what are they provoking me for? Well, if I did that back there, can I do something about this situation? If he got you out of one sixth belt, can he get you out of another one? If he got you out of one trouble, can he get you out of another one? Bless God, if he got me out of sin, he can take me out of the grave. He's God. What difference does it make? Just go out. Keep your eyes on him. So if I close the Red Sea behind and drown them Egyptians, can I do something about this water? What do you make me angry about? Oh, your unbelief. You provoke me to anger. Because of unbelief. Now the word here is you sin. Provoke made. The reason they did it, they disbelieved. They never went out and got the shooting craps now and things like that. They never run around with somebody else's wife and went out and told lies. That wasn't what they were doing. But that's not sin to begin with. Living in adultery is not sin. Smoking, chewing, drinking, gambling, cursing, swearing, so forth. That's not sin. That's the attributes of unbelief. You do that because you're an unbeliever. If you are a believer, you don't do that. Amen. That's the reason she said, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that set me has everlasting life. Not says he believes, but really believes. Amen. There it is. That takes all your initial evidence away. See? Amen. There you are. Amen. Not he that heareth my words and shouts. Not he that heareth my words and speaks with tongues. Not he that heareth my words and has blood in his hand. Or in his face. Or whatever more. That's not it. He that heareth my words and believeth on him and sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death to life. Amen. What he's saying? Unbelief. A little something can raise up. Instead of going right to the scripture and find out where it's true or not. Oh, he said, I, I see. There you go ahead. I'm just continued Presbyterian like I am. Go ahead. Blind. 
and you provoke God. When God does anything, he expects the nation to grab it. But instead of that, you know, well, I don't know about that, see. He expects the people to get it. If you're concerned, just sit down with the scripture. Go through it and search it back and forth and see if it happened, if it's predicted to come to pass and so forth. Then you'll get it. Amen. Now, notice. While it is today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as in the provocation, when God was provoked with them, you see. For some, when they had heard, heard the gospel, Moses preached, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. How many knows how many people are saved out of that original bunch that come out? How many? Two is right. How many knows their names? That's right, Caleb and Joshua. The only two out of two million something. Listen to this. But he, the 17th verse now, but with whom he was grieved 40 years because of unbelief. Was it not with them that had sinned, disbelieved? Take the dictionary and find out what sin means. Take the Bible dictionary. It's unbelief. Unbelief is sin. He that believeth not is condemned already, St. John 4. Condemned already. Whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? You're disbelieving. Oh, how I never get to my chapter, but look. That's what's the matter with this nation today. Signs and wonders is crossed through this nation. What do they do? Continually turn their back on them. And he said, I'll swear that I'll not let them enter into the land they started to. What's the matter with these big churches today? Their unbelief has provoked God. Hallelujah. He's able of these stones to rise children to Abraham. He tried to give the gospel to them and they hardened their hearts. They caught themselves and they made little denominations and we believe this and nothing else and God couldn't move in. Where are they at today? Sitting on a sideline. God's little faithful group is moving right along with signs and wonders. He's putting them to the test. Every son that cometh to God must first be tried and tested. Child train. First little thing happens. Oh, well, maybe this doesn't do it anyhow. You're an illegitimate child and not a child of God. For a child of God is the seed of Abraham who calls those things that were not as though they were. God said so and just keeps moving on. Amen. Amen. No matter what says or anything different, they keep moving on anyhow. God said so. 25 years he waited for that baby. No matter how contrary it was. And he separated himself from them unbelievers. Amen. Amen. So he could believe. Oh my, I feel religious. Think of it. You've got to separate yourself from that dogma of the world. Ah, oh, them days of miracles just passed. There's no such a thing as that. That's fanaticism. Separate yourself. Amen. The Bible said, come out from among them and be ye separated, saith the Lord, and I will receive you. How wonderful. I will receive you after you separate yourself. You shall be my children, I'll be your God. Separate yourself. Don't yoke yourself up with unbelievers. That's right. Young man getting married. Married some girl that don't believe. Or some young girl marrying a boy that don't believe. She do that. I don't care how cute he is and and, uh, how cute she is and what those big eyes she's got. They'll all fade out one of these days. But brother, your soul will go live forever. Be careful what you're doing. She ain't a real believer. Him a real believer. Don't you yoke yourself up like that. Stay away from such. It'll cause you trouble down the road. Now, listen. 17th verse. But whom he was, he grieved 40 years. Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, to whom he swore that they should not enter into the rest? They started out. But they seen the miracles. But they never did get to the promised land. Just a selected number of two enter the promised land. Now, what's Paul doing? He's speaking to the Christians now. Don't you let this same gospel that was preached back yonder 
and signs and wonders and the pillar of fire led them. And when these things go to taking place again, don't you fall over the wayside by unbelief to go to Doubting, for their carcass fell in the wilderness. Now we're coming in quickly now. Watch close. But to them that live not, so we see that they should not enter in because of unbelief. He calls it sin once, calls it unbelief the next time. Unbelief is sin. They entered not because of their unbelief. They seen that prophet Moses. They seen what he'd done. Seen what he said. It was truth every time. Moved right on the truth. This pillar of fire would appear before him. They watched it. They seen it. Paul trying to get, they later on get down here to the experience that he had. See, trying to relate the spirits, tighten it to the Old Testament. He said, now we've entered into a new thing, to this new dispensation by Jesus Christ. Old times, the Lord appeared to him by the prophets, but now he's by his son, Jesus. See, and he will begin to type the experiences and show him what was taking place, how the signs and wonders and everything, and what's wrong. Now he said, they entered not because of their unbelief. They did not believe. But now... We remove into a dispensation, and don't you harden your heart. Don't you act like they did in the days of provocation when they provoked God. How they do it? Not believing immorally. Let me grind this down to you. You say, Brother Branham, I go to church. That's all right. I never lied in my life. That's fine. I never stole. I never done this, that, or the other. That's very fine. That's all good. But that still isn't sin. The sin is when God shows himself and you disbelieve it. Amen. You won't listen to it. Oh, you say, my church don't teach that. As long as the Bible teaches it and God proves it, that's the thing. Amen. Now, watch just a moment. Now we're going to start now on something real, real deep. Now, put your conscience in your vest pocket till you get outside. Now, watch real close. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us to enter into his, his, her personal pronouns now. What? Any of you should seem to come short of it. Now Paul's trying to tell them in the previous chapter about all these things, but now he's trying to tell them what it is. Oh, have we got time? I, maybe we better wait till tonight. It's getting late and we're going to have prayer service. Maybe we better catch it tonight. Because this is really full of vitamins. <laughs> Spiritual vitamins. We've got a lot to do and busy this afternoon. Let us, let us therefore fear less a promise. Now, do they have a promise for the promised land? Down in Egypt? And when God came down... To make this promise a reality, why God told Abraham hundreds and hundreds of years before that he's going to do it. It was scriptural. Joseph said, don't you move my bones from here until you go to that promised land and bury me up there with the rest of my fathers. Because he knew the resurrection was coming when Jesus rose from the dead. Because he know what Job said. See, each one of them prophets know just what the other prophet had said and know that their spirit was the same. And they was watching Oh, brother. Boy, that ought to shake us out of our worldly condition. They had their eyes. I don't know what people are saying, but what them prophets said. Each one of them was watching. Abraham said, bury me right here where Job was buried. Said, Sarah, I'm going to buy a piece of ground. We're going to be buried right here. Isaac was a prophet after his daddy. He said, listen, don't you bury me anywhere else. Not down here in Egypt, but you take me right back in the promised land. You bury me right here. Jacob died down a promised land, but said to his son, who was a prophet, said, you know, one night the angel touched me on the side and I've limped ever since. Come put your hand. Amen. Oh, mercy. My prophet son, I'm old and I'm blind, but put your holy hand and be the prophet yourself. Lay it on the place where the angel had his hand and swear to the God of heaven that you'll not bury me down here. Amen. Blessed be, do you see the spiritual revelation of the word? Well, hey, brother, 90% didn't know what he's talking about. But he knew what he was talking about. Put your prophet hands on this place where the angel laid his hand. I was once a big stout man, a robust coward. But he touched me, and since then I've been a limping man, but I've been a prince ever since I limped. 
Ever since I changed my way of walking, I've been a prince. <laughs> yes. Put your hand in your swear to the God of heaven, you'll not bury me here. Why? No one knows what he was talking about. Joseph did. He said, take me up here and bury me in that promised land. <laughs> There's where it was at. Certainly, when Joseph died years later, he said, don't you bury me down here. But you look at my bones when you pass by, because someday you're going out of here. And when you go, take my bones with you. <laughs> there you are. Let the world say what they won't do and do what they won't do. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Keep me in Christ if I'm called anything a fanatic or a holy roller. Someday he's coming. And those that are in Christ will God bring with him when he comes. It's all a spiritual revealed truth. Laying right there and it takes a spiritual mind to catch it. Rest on that through the day. Think of it. Even if you do without your dinner, think of it. And tonight... We'll go into his rest that was left and see what this promise is today. What is this thing today? If God has got you here to Bible and prove it, it's right here now, then I'm a false prophet. That's exactly right. Amen. But it's here. What is this rest? He said, now let us fear, lest the promise being left us to enter in just like they did. And it's got to be the same promise. It's got to be the same rest. It's got to be the same God. It's got to be the same sign. It's got to be the same thing. Amen. But let us stress out what is it. May the Lord grant it to us tonight while we bow our head. Blessed Lord, only eternity will reveal the great things that we now share together. Little as many who are ordained to condemnation, as thou hast said in the book of Jude, that man of old, foreordained to condemnation, would take the grace of our God and turn it into lasciviousness. And many today are preaching the gospel. The grace of God turn it into a money-making scheme. Hey. Having a great big church and the most in Sunday school. Taking the grace of God and turn it into lasciviousness. And the world's blind. They're going like blind pigs. They don't understand. Oh, God, open to us understanding. Let our understanding not be like the children of this world. For thou hast said in thy word that the children of this world are wiser than the children of the light. In the beginning it was so. The children of Cain become great master scientists. They become great educators. They become workers of material. They went on progressing, very religious, but was condemned and drowned in the judgment. And their carcasses floated on the water and their souls went to hell. And Jesus went and spoke to them when he died and went to hell and preached to the souls that was in prison that repented not in the long suffering of the days of Noah, saith the scripture. And God as he stood on earth, he said, As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the coming of the Son of Man. But we notice the lineage then of Seth, humble man, real man of God, not knowing too much of the things of the world, caring nothing for the things of the world, but a laid aside ever weight and to believe God and become prophets and great man in the kingdom while the others, the other religious world laughed at him made fun of them. But the hour come when the floods and judgment came. So was it in the coming of Jesus Christ. How they laughed and made fun of him while they had their own religions and their great churches. But they made fun of the morning star. And they laughed at him. But yet they entered into judgment. And when they flee and went into the Jerusalem, there they eat their own children from starvation and their blood run out the street gates when they burnt the city and the temple and their souls went into hell. Lord, here we are again on the third. This is the lifetime. Three is the number of life. And here we are ready for the rapture. The church moving on. The great scientist world. The church is today set full of skeptic believers. Tens of thousands with their names on the book. Yes, millions. And would laugh at the gospel. And say that 
they're uneducated. They don't know. Maybe that's so hard. But what we lack in education, you make up in grace. But sending your angel of light by manifesting his power, confirming the words to those who are poor and illiterate as we. But we love you for this because it's the grace of God that has did it. And we know that we were born and we're not lovely at all. We're very unlovely, but thou through grace reached down thy merciful hand and has opened our eyes as Jesus prayed for us, as Elijah did for Gehazi, as he looked to see around him. And today our eyes are open and we see the things of God and know we're moving at the end time when the Gentile people's days are about finished and he'll take a people for his name. Let us be included there, Lord. Humbly we beg. We pray that you'll grant it. Bless us. Bless this little audience this morning. They're made up of all different types of religions and beliefs. But lay them aside today, God, and may they look straight towards Calvary. Say, God, mold me and make me. I'm like the, the prophet said that he went out to the potter's house that he might be broke up and remolded. Mold us and make us after the fashion that God would have us. No matter if we have to be the floor mat at the house of the Lord, I'd rather be the doormat than to dwell in tents with the wicked in granite, Lord. Just bless us now and keep us humble. Let our hearts be open, our minds clear to the things of God. For we ask it in Christ's name, with our heads bowed. I wonder if someone would want to be remembered in a word of prayer for your salvation of your soul. Would you raise your hand? This is sinner. God bless you, young fella. Someone else, God bless you back there, sir. God bless you, lady. Someone else like to be remembered in prayer just now for your soul. God bless you, sir, with your hand up. And God bless you and you here. Wonderful. Would there be another just before closing? I feel it be. God bless you back there, sir, in the back. Say, now look, I want to ask you something. I don't want you to think at all because it's this little tabernacle. I don't want you to think it's because it's this people. And merciful God don't think it's because that the angel of the Lord had his picture taken with me and I and, and so, uh, that to do that. Oh, God, if I felt that way, then, brother, I need to be at the altar instead of asking you. But I'm only saying this. I'm only saying this by the scripture that you'll see that this is the truth. If I said it, and that's all there was to it, went on like any other preacher or something other, or any other, well, then it would be different. But you see, the thing, God comes right back around and proves that it's the truth. See? That's what makes it real is God proving it. And then not only that, but his word says that he'll do it. Here he is doing it. Now, if you're not in the right, your heart's not right with God, would you just raise your hand? Say, pray for me. All right, right where you are. About eight or ten hands has been up wanting mercy for their soul. While you have your heads bowed, now you pray. Remember, you're the one to repent. I'm only asking for you that God will be merciful. But that's the altar. God has brought you to a place in your mind. That's the altar. We believe in coming to the altar, sure. But that doesn't, that doesn't, it's all right. But your real altar is where God's met you. And he's met you right where you're sitting. Amen. That's your altar. Now I say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And from this day on, if you'll help me, I'll live for you. I, I'll serve you. I don't care what anyone says. I'm stepping out this morning. I'm praying right here. And you take this old sassy spirit away from me. You take this temper away from me. I know I can't act like that and be right with God. And I got hatred in my heart. I'm jealous. I got malice. I got this, that. Take it out, God. I don't want to be like that. Make me sweet and humble and meek. Make me gentle. Make me such a person I can win others to you. Let me do something for you to show appreciations in my life. That's the prayer you pray now while we pray together. Heavenly Father, they're yours. They're the fruits of the message this morning. They raise their hand. Something made them do that. They, def they defied the laws of gravitation when they raised their hands. There was a spirit in them that made a decision. They raised up their hands that they accepted the Creator who made them. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you will bless them and give to them eternal life. Right now, there's nothing I could do. Call them around the altar, put them in the next free room, doing all the work it, it takes you to do it, Lord. We can't do no more than preach the Word. You said, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the Word, the Word of God. Now, we've preached the word, and they've raised their hands that they believed it. 
Now give them everlasting life because you promised you'd do it. And if they were sincere in raising their hands, they'll go out of this building this morning a sweet, meek, humble Christian because you promised it and your words cannot fail. I ask it in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Now I am watching, waiting, and longing for that bright city John saw coming down. In that bright city, worship now. Holy white city, I have a mansion, a heart, and a crown. Now I am watching. you just love him. The message is over now. This is worship. We don't come to church just to hear a message. We come to worship. Just forget the person next to you. Just worship him. Oh, how beautiful, how wonderful. Just tell him in your, you don't have to tell him loud. Just tell him in your heart, I love you, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. Oh, my. Holy white city, I have a mansion, a heart, and a Now I am watching, waiting, and longing for that white city John saw coming down. Now, Father God, receive us. We are waiting as we're listening at the word. Longing our hearts thirst after thee like the heart paineth for the water brook. Our soul thirsts after thee, O God. Longing and waiting. Waiting that hour that when Jesus shall come. Waiting to the time that we'll be summoned to the sky. Not to stand before the judge and judgment is done past. We're dead to the things of the world and entered into Christ. And he took our judgment. He's our attorney now at the seat of justice. Our blessed attorney. That on our confession he pleads our case till we know that we're unworthy. As the dear old sister this morning said in her testimony and putting in her pennies, since I come here, I learned that it's not my holiness, it's God's holiness. Truly, Lord, we teach the people there's nothing good in man, not one thing. What is man at the heart, mind, beloved? But it's a grace of God that's appeared to us. And we trust only in his merits, not in our own. And we worship the most holy God. For thy goodness to include us in thy great kingdom and in our great plans. We receive thee into our hearts by faith and by grace. We believe that you give it to us for the glory of God, for the service of God. 
Now, Lord, heal the sick as they come up to be prayed for this morning. Give to them that joy that they long to be well. Let them know that this little light affliction was put upon them in just a little testing time. God knows all about it. He did it to see what we'd do about it. How, God, may they step right out there and claim that finished work. May, you, may they not provoke you by being running here and there and in and out. Well, I don't know this, that. Lord, may they take a straight stand. Say, Lord, you are the one who saved me. You are the one who did these things for me. I believe you. And I'm trusting you today. And I pray that you'll grant this to the people in Christ's name. Amen.